All right, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to, welcome and welcome back to the ecosystem room, ecosystem B room. I've been told it's much better than ecosystem A room. <laughs> uh, thank you for, <laughs> for laughing at the end of the day. Um, but I'm Dan Powers, I work at Docker on uh, partner engineering. And I'm happy to welcome Kevin Crawley here uh, from Instana, who's going to tell us about visualizing containers and analyzing performance. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. So, would it surprise you to find out that in three seconds, your laptop just processed almost 300 billion instructions? and that in three seconds, nearly 100 terabytes of data have been transferred over the internet. This is true. And in three seconds, over $17,000 in transactions has been transferred through the largest online retailer in the world. In three seconds, Instana can analyze your stack and determine when components are unavailable or degraded. So my name is Kevin Crawley, and if those of you who don't know me, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where I help found the Docker Nashville Meetup Group, Golang Meetup, and Serverless Meetup. And I joined Instana in April of this year as a developer evangelist. Prior to that, I was the lead DevOps engineer at Franklin American Mortgage Company. And prior to that, I've held titles such as SRE, senior application developer, web developer, and food delivery specialist. I can honestly say that I've been a server. Some dad jokes, never mind. So I've also been recognized by Docker as a captain for my work both in the community and professionally. And in a moment, I'll be speaking to you about digital transformation and the impact that it's having at organizations who until recently have never really considered building software as a core business imperative. Companies across the globe, and quite likely uh, even your own, are experiencing this firsthand. There are several Docker Enterprise customers who are here speaking about those experiences, including my previous employer, Franklin American. Now, digital transformation is based upon the premise that in order to stay relevant in today's market, businesses must transition to a practice where they become experts at building and delivering software. As a result of those requirements, IT has responded with agile development, things like Scrum, Kanban, XP, and these are approaches where the requirements and solutions for software evolve through active collaboration with your business. Embracing the cloud, and if this is not a hosted solution, uh, on-premise solutions exist, such as Docker EE, OpenShift, Rancher, uh, there's several others now, and providing consistent and fast access to resources. The microservice architecture, which means cloud native applications, tend to work better when developed by agile teams. Containers and orchestration, which I feel is the consistency through which pipelines uh, enable teams to easily deploy their software. Now the benefit of this process has been the reduction in time it takes to build and deploy applications. Now, before we dive into the first part of my presentation, I, I wanted to lay the groundwork for what we'll be talking about today. Uh, now, I, I strongly believe that organizations should begin leveraging open source software for monitoring early in their journey. Now, there's a wealth of pre-built and pre-configured systems for every uh, container orchestration platform out there. And these tools can quickly and with relatively little cost enable you to get started with some very powerful tools. As systems become more diverse, distributed, data-driven, observability of these have become even more critical in the operation of those systems. Now, teams that I've led and that I've worked with that have gone through fairly exhaustive DIY processes with each of these technologies I'll be talking about, they range from anywhere from a few hundred containers to several thousand. Each of them has had their strengths and weakness, but what I believe each of them do eventually is teach us some of the challenges of dealing with not only the applications, but their data at scale. So the following technologies have had tremendous impact on the, for organizations who have recognized the importance of observability. They've leveraged these tools 
primarily for solving the following three problems. Collecting the metrics and alerting, collecting the interactions that occur within a microservice environment, and collecting logs, and again, alerting. I realize that the Elk stack is capable of more than just collecting logs, uh, as they have launched their own solution for APM. For the purpose of this talk, we'll kind of be focusing on the traditional Elk stack. So first up, I wanna talk a little bit about Prometheus, which is a time series database that stores data in a linear fashion. It has a robust query language, and it has an alerting system integrated into the application itself. Now Grafana will help you build dashboards based on queries that you write for not only alerting, but for gathering information from those metrics, along with many other data sources and integrations, and these will enable you to create graphs and KPIs from those sources. Next is Open Tracing and Jaeger, which are both CNCF backed projects. These tools empower engineers to increase the observability of the systems they build and manage. They have a lot of support around many different languages, including Java, Go, JavaScript, C Sharp, Objective C, Ruby, PHP, probably a few others. There's a lot of driver support for .NET and Java, including Kafka, Cassandra, JDBC, Elasticsearch. And the storage backend where it collects and puts all of these traces include Cassandra, Elasticsearch, and there's experimental drivers such as Influx and DynamoDB. Now finally, we'll talk a little bit about ELK, which is actually an acronym for a stack or a set of services that provide log collection, aggregation, storage, and querying. The stack is usually comprised of Elasticsearch, Kibana, and while Logstash is the de facto standard for collection, it's usually coupled with an exporter such as Beats or FluentD. There's also Greylog, which completely obliterates Logstash. Uh, there's some other things out there too that you can kind of plug into this ecosystem and change you know, based on what your requirements are. Now, as far as it being a standard, I'm not aware of any other open source technologies that share feature parity with, with the Elk stack. It has a vast landscape of documentation, libraries, and support across many different technologies. And Elasticsearch is generally easy to scale as long as you understand some of its limitations and the requirements. Now, the tools that we just went over are fantastic, and they've helped countless organizations take the initial steps of that digital transformation journey, where I believe they will continue to serve you well after day zero. Now, earlier I suggested that these technologies can teach engineers the complexity of scale, and there is one thing I've learned over the past several years while helping teams make that transition to cloud native, is the, ter the term scale can mean something different to everyone I've spoken to. Now, for the purpose of today's presentation, I'll be discussing the issues of scale around the volume of telemetry data these new systems can generate, or the size, and the amount of work that has been introduced around these tools. When each new application is deployed, including that application's framework, database tools, or even the language, which could mean scope. Now, I wanna cover some of the pain points with scaling the same tools that I just spoke to you about in the next few slides. Now the teams I've worked with and the engineers with whom I've spoke have all expressed some frustration when attempting to scale in these following four areas. Collection, retention, analyzing, or processing. Uh, querying, I, I suppose it could be crack, but crack's not funny, so. Now before I begin discussing on some of those pain points of the technologies, I understand that some people may view these issues as trivial, I hope that you can kind of see where these could be challenging for very small teams or even individuals who have been given the task of implementing these things in their organizations. Now, you'll also find speaker notes in uh, the following slides calling out to various articles and research documents talking about these pain points in, in very, a lot more depth than I'll be going over today. So first up, is Prometheus, which I feel is fairly straightforward uh, to use. You expose an endpoint for Prometheus, define an endpoint, and let it take you wherever it goes. Now, the things that get challenging are at scale. So when you roll up data to reduce query times for large subsets of data, maybe like, like Graphite, you can't really do that with Prometheus. Uh, retention no more than a few hours may cause performance issues while querying, especially on large data sets. Now the only real option here is to process the data and either store it somewhere else 
or recollect the rolled up data. Uh, that sounds like a pain. And I don't know how many people tried to use GitLab's Grafana while they had the GitHub Exodus a couple weeks ago? Anybody? So it fell over, like literally just stopped working because the amount of people that started hitting it, and they were trying to scale it up, but literally there was not enough, there was not a server big enough to let them scale to where it would stop crashing. So finally, defining the alerts around those technology becomes an issue when there's zero operational knowledge of these new technologies being adopted in organizations. And I believe the last item does warrant some elaboration uh, and even a blog post whenever I get around to it. So I've met and I've spoken with several people whose primary role in their organization is to define, refine, and constantly respond to the alerts and for their infrastructure and the applications they support. How many people here, just a show of hands, currently have or had similar roles in the past? Anybody? So keep your hands up. Keep it up if you actually love writing alert definitions. Nobody. I, well, I was gonna say we're hiring, but so uh, anyways, I've personally been in this role before and I absolutely hated it. I had to constantly struggle extracting expert knowledge from the app devs themselves who really often didn't fully understand the impact of these systemic, systemic failures in their own domain. And then I was finding myself challenged to respond to those vaguely defined alerts with really two outcomes, uh, alert fatigue or refining the alerts to the point where they were ignored and eventually just the whole thing fell apart. So the people I've worked with and the teams I've worked with in the past uh, weren't really afraid to tackle new problems with new technologies. Um, that experience has been fantastic. And I suspect that everyone here uh, can identify as someone who is passionate about that continuous learning. And I'm, a, I'm of the mindset that everyone should take ownership of authoring alerts and responding to them. If you're in an organization where that's a culture, you should stay there. There's not many. So I wanna talk about the pain points of open tracing and Jaeger as well. These are relatively easy tools to deploy and the pain points probably lean more towards the UX side of things Storage and I.O. can get expensive, especially when you're instrumenting thousands of services. That data adds up quick, so you have to have a retention policy and get rid of it, or you're gonna spend a lot of money. So the root cause analysis process, uh, what this means is, uh, Jaeger will tell you if Redis goes down and that you know, a service was impacted by it but it won't necessarily tell you that Redis went down because the disk was full or the memory limits had been exceeded. And it will not tell you also if that particular outage caused a failure across 20 different microservices. You, just, you have to make that correlation yourself. So the metrics around timings, status, and counts, they can all be instrumented uh, when collected by Prometheus. Uh, when the alerts are defined there in Prometheus, and we kind of already discussed some of the pain points around that technology. So Elk, it's the same thing. You have the storage cost, if you wanna retain logs for any amount of time. Uh, now, optimizing indices is really more, again, it's on the storage cost. If you're gonna be keeping log retention for months or years, you have to optimize those indices or you're just gonna start throwing money away. Uh, and grok patterns are powerful, and I hear that gray log helps solve some of this problem, so I'm not gonna go into detail with it. And again, with the alert, defining those are a pain, and it's also a pain getting those alerts too much. So a colleague of mine at Franklin American had learned about Instana at DevOps Days last year. Uh, we'd begun kind of feeling some of the pain of scaling out our operation, having several hundred containers running in our, uh, in our environment. And we were really tired of defining alerts, having to fully understand, you know, things like Cassandra and Kafka that, we were, that our developers are trying to bring into our organization to help make solving business problems easier for them. However, we didn't necessarily understand how to run those technologies very well, at least not in the beginning. So after a short trial period with Instana, the team had decided that uh, 
those problems that we were talking about, it helped solve some of those and allowed the business and the developers to focus on what really mattered, the domain. And that's where I believe open source tools still have some tremendous value in your organization, is that you can actually collect uh, business metrics with Prometheus and have meaningful dashboards of something other than you know, CPU usage on all your containers. So I, I do wanna give you kind of an abridged history of APM and the tooling around APM, because it helped me better understand some of the limitations that we were dealing with, with other solutions that are on the market. So APM originally made an appearance uh, somewhere around the turn of the millennium. Critical applications were transitioning uh, from the mainframe to being web applications, and these were running on Java J2EE application servers. Now these were your standard kind of three-tiered monolithic applications. The, the value proposition of the first APM tools was production visibility inside of Java and later .NET. About 10 years ago, uh, there was a shift in application architecture and critical deployment. This was banking on reusing components and applying, applying SOA or service-oriented architecture uh, to application development and deployment. So a new set of tools emerged. Uh, they could deal with multiple applications running shared code and systems. And flow maps, production profiling, became the value proposition of those tools. Uh, their primary functionality was still built around the production visibility of code, though, because uh, that's where we really care about problems happening. So we kind of come to today, where we have the extreme rapid adoption of microservice technologies, especially containers and serverless. And we're far removed from monolithic applications and even code-centric applications and their monitoring. And code visibility is still very much a part of the equation. The simple fact is there are thousands of potentially problematic interactions that can happen in your microservice application that really have nothing to do with a single piece of code. Now, the third generation of mission-critical web apps are so complex that it's no longer possible for a human to really understand that request or even uh, how the application is performing across the entire system. So I was very impressed with Instana, the team, technology, and the experience that I had with them that after operationalizing the tools that we were building at Franklin to support a cloud-native workflow, I decided to join them and help others make that same journey. And what probably impressed me the most with Instana was how we visualized infrastructure. So what you're looking at here is each stack represents a host. And within each one of those stacks, there's multiple services represented by blocks. Now the service could be a container, a process, or even a serverless function. And as we hover over the stack, notice how we can quickly see a summary of the workload that's running. Now we've combined this information that we gather from the orchestration platform, such as Kubernetes, uh, scaffolding a wealth of information that we collect with simply a single agent running on that host. So as your ecosystem builds, so do the data requirements. Now, we leverage Elasticsearch by our query engine to enable users to build and store filters for specific views. So as you can imagine, a large environment like this can become quite extravagant and overwhelming. And it made sense for us to enable users to have the ability to refine the views with the Elasticsearch query language because it is so powerful. Now, what you're looking at here is over 3,000 containers. And with this particular environment, it creates a staggering amount of metric and trace data. So data collection is still a pain, right? We're creating, or we're, we're consuming roughly 60,000 messages consumed via Kafka per second. There's roughly 500 hosts being monitored in that environment. Over 17 megabytes of traces, application and infrastructure metrics are collected every minute. And this environment consumes around 20 terabytes of disk space on Elasticsearch and Cassandra, and this is a rolling average. What this much information does give us, though, is the unprecedented, unprecedented ability to visualize an alert on systems in as close as real time as possible. So 
changes to your services, applications, and transactions that are occurring in your system are reflected in real time with only a three second delay. And we're, we're seeing here a real time visualization of traces flowing throughout a microservice application. Now we've leveraged open tracing to solve the problem of span context across a large swath of OSS services such as Nginx, Cassandra, Kafka, middleware packages including gRPC, ORMs, and custom application and business logic that has been constructed around those tools. We also visualize uh, service interruptions as you see a red stream start flowing across the map, things start turning yellow and red. And uh, this is indicating spikes in latency, failed requests such as 500s, and database errors. Now, how many of you are familiar with the project named Visceral? It's a Netflix OSS project. So that's actually what this is built on. Uh, we, we took Visceral and we, we put open trace spans behind it to give you this visualization. So the only real way that you can visualize the traces that you just saw up here was that tremendous granularity. With a single agent, and in many cases, no changes are even required to your running applications, we're able to automatically load, detect, and instrument those application services using that open trace framework. And because we're collecting with some of the most scalable technologies that exist today, such as Kafka and Cassandra, we're able to consume and report on all those metrics with as little as one second of granularity. So since I mentioned that we are using OpenTrace to drive our spans, we've taken several opportunities to decorate these spans, associating the underlying infrastructure, code level analysis, and specific integrations we built with a large variety of database providers. So if you've ever used the CNCF Project Jaeger, you're probably familiar with how tracing works and how powerful it is. And when we combine that with the accuracy and granularity of one second uh, metrics, it's possible to do some pretty interesting things with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the first thing we do is baseline performance analysis. So we can look for deviations and averages and since we have a deep understanding of technologies and what a failure is for that particular technology, such as maybe drop messages in Cassandra, 500s from a Spring Boot app, or uh, missing shards from Elasticsearch. We can rate and score these deviations and assign a confidence level to it based on if we think it's a failure or not. So the idea of predictive algorithms is that we can recognize that at 10 o'clock every day, a service gets bombarded with erroneous requests because of a bad batch job that was scheduled. Now, we can be relatively certain that it's gonna happen tomorrow. I think the question becomes more around UX and how we present that to the operations engineers to say, is this a problem or is this okay? In our recommendation engine, we've gathered best practices for over 100 different technologies we put it in a database and we make recommendations based on the information that we gather. And finally, root cause analysis and correlation. And this is because of the holistic view afforded by the collection and correlation of our information. We can kind of group issues that occur across the entire ecosystem. And we can not only create actionable alerts, but we can roll up those alerts into a single incident. Now, I don't necessarily expect Stan to become sentient and kill us all, but he will tell you when our applications are failing. So what you're seeing here is actually that rolled up uh, analysis. And what Stan is doing, he's attempting to determine if the root cause of an issue is systemic or an isolated problem. And this gives us a holistic and accurate depiction of the environment simply because it's a must, you have to have that. And because of the quality, the quantity, and correlation of that data which is being collected, we're able to confidently aggregate issues, determine the root cause, and alert the operators to what we feel is the problem. So we got about five or six minutes for questions. The microphone is right up there. If anybody wants to come up and throw something at me, it's fine. Any questions? Now's the time. Are you gonna stick around for a little bit afterwards? Or? Yes, okay. I will be around. So I do wanna invite you guys to come and see us at our booth. 
uh, and I'll be there tomorrow from 1.30 to 3 at uh, S10. So the other thing is I wanna get your feedback and I wanna hear from you and what you think about my talk and about Instana. And if you could, Follow me on Twitter, share what it is, and you'll be entered to win a pretty cool projector. And there's not that many people here, so you have a pretty good chance of winning this. So again, it's not sure of Kevin on Twitter, and feel free to follow me uh, if you want. That's great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.